Welcome back to Diet Doctor News on YouTube. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Schur, the medical director at dietdoctor.com. And today we're going to talk about a couple different studies, and we're going to hear from Dr. Ty Beal. Now, Ty has a PhD in geography with an emphasis in global nutrition from the University of California, Davis. And he's a research advisor on the knowledge leadership team at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN, G-A-I-N. And um, he supports programs, research, evaluation, and dissemination of knowledge to stakeholders about basically nutrition across the world and nutrition inadequacy. So he is an expert on nutrition adequacies and deficiencies and how to overcome them. But specifically today, we're talking about his response to two recent papers. One is this Food Compass um, published by Dr. Mazafarian and his crew at, at Tufts. And um, we've commented on it before with our YouTube video. I've got a podcast with Ty coming up later that has some more detail. But the point is, it's a, it's a fairly faulty system with a lot of holes in it. And Ty wrote a, along with some, with his colleagues, wrote a response to the journal about it and a response to the authors themselves and have heard nothing. And that's a little concerning because this is supposed to be a very impactful type of um, publication that is this food compass, this scoring system is meant to help individuals and governments and institutions pick healthy foods basically. So if it's got errors and holes in it, we need to know that before it starts being used um, in, a, in a broader fashion. And well, what are some of the holes? Well, let's look at some of the specifics. Um, you know, watermelon and kale are exactly the same, um, whereas their nutrient composition really isn't, but they both get a score of 100. Then also in the green zone of eat as much as you want are frosted mini wheats, non-fat frozen yogurt, chocolate covered almonds, orange juice, and honey nut Cheerios, all in the green eat as much as you want. Those are all processed junk foods, basically, a lot of them. Um, so that, that's pretty surprising. And then in the middle ground, um, uh, what they have is their yellow. They have... Um, Skinless chicken breast at a score of 61, but then right behind that at a score of 60 is Lucky Charms. And then several, shortly after that is canned pineapple in heavy syrup. Um, and then almond M&Ms, uh, all an ice cream with nuts, all with all within this middle ground. And then on the lowest ground are, is a whole egg fried in butter, ground beef, and cheddar cheese. And those are restrict or do not eat. So much worse off to eat an egg with cheddar cheese and beef than it is to eat honey nut Cheerios, drink your orange juice, have some chocolate covered almonds with some non-fat yogurt and your lucky charms. Okay, pretty clear the system has some flaws, all right? So they should be addressed and the author should be very forthcoming with um, the reasons they they um, made it the way they did and their evidence and so forth, but they've there's been no response as Ty is going to say. So the other paper he wrote a response to is the uncertainties and impact of small targeted dietary changes on human health and environmental stability. Now for this one, it's even worse as you're going to hear him say peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are like some, one of the top things you can eat for improving your lifespan and cereal, snack bars, candy, and sugar are all, are all better than poultry, eggs, and, and red meat. So that's also kind of pretty concerning. Um, and, but same sort of thing. And they say, they say, if you ate one hot dog, you take 36 minutes off your life. Mm, okay. I'm not so sure the evidence supports that. So here's the point though. Ty Beal and his colleagues have drafted very reasonable responses and they've gotten no response. Why is that? And what do we have to do differently to improve the scientific process? Let's get into the interview with Dr. Ty Beal. Well, Ty Beal, welcome back. I'm glad you can join me again, this time on Diet Doctor News. And I'm really interested to hear your perspective about what's going on with your response, along with some of your colleagues, to the food compass and also this article about the, the impact of small dietary changes. So let's start with the food compass and, and tell me the background of why you felt it was so important to respond to the journal about this published food compass and then what sort of the response was from that. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, several colleagues of mine and myself have sort of reviewed the paper briefly and didn't feel like the uh, results or the findings made a lot of sense. Um, we had a lot of questions about why would these foods come out this way? And so we decided to take a deeper dive into the details. And, you know, what we found is that there are probably a lot of perspectives about, you know, how different um, 
components should be weighted or scored. But I think there's actually a lot of um, pretty important issues with the way that the analyses were done. And so uh, with Food Compass, when we went through it in detail, we, we pointed out a lot of these issue in this, in issues in this comment. And I, you know, we were expecting to potentially receive a response from authors, um, hopefully have the editor think these are important um, critiques that should be discussed openly in the public sphere, um, or at least be peer reviewed to really see, you know, how valid are these critiques, how valid um, was the original paper, and um, just bring that sort of into the public discussion in a scientific way. Yeah, and I think it's important to differentiate. Is this, you know, a response to the paper saying, I disagree, I don't believe it's right? Or was it a response to the paper with more, you know, references and peer-reviewed citations, and this is why we see problems with it? I mean, um, you know, I know the answer to that, but I think it's important for you to point out which which of those two it was. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I think there is certainly an aspect of uh, perspectives and opinions which differ between experts. So there's that that component, but there's a lot that I feel like is, um, you know, scientifically grounded, where we say we don't feel that this the approach used really reflects the evidence base. And then there's also some concerns about errors in the actual paper itself. So I think both of those issues are important to to consider um, critically. And it's it, you're right, it's not just something where we were like, oh, we just don't like this approach. And we're just gonna state our opinion about it. Um, it was really more uh, concerns about the way that the analysis was conducted and how the evidence was um, used to, to make some of these decisions along the way, which oftentimes seemed arbitrary and produced results that were at times, we felt really unjustified based on the current evidence. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you were able to at least post it um, online, even though it wasn't accepted by the journal and published by the journal. It's posted for people to see, and we can link to it. And, I mean, very, very reasonable um, response to it that, um, you know, the, the ultra-processed foods aren't really downgraded. Um, phytochemicals are given the same weight as protein and fiber, um, whereas like protein, we, we sort of need for survival and we know we need a certain amount and there's kind of no known level of phytochemicals that we need that EPA and DHA are graded the same as ALA, despite the fact that you need to convert ALA to EPA and DHA. Um, the Nova score for ultra processed food just had like a minimal impact. All of these things are, are ex very reasonable. And then you also, like you said, pointed out where there are actual errors. Like you did the work to see that there are actual errors. So if I was the author of this food compass and I was creating it to be used in a broad reaching manner to help people make decisions, I would want that feedback. I would want to know that feedback and I would want to respond. But can you, I guess it's putting you in an awkward position, but could you even guess why the authors wouldn't respond to this or why it seems like they wouldn't be interested in this feedback? You know, I don't know the answer, but I do know it's probably hard to respond to, to criticism in a lot of ways. Um, maybe there's just, um, they don't want to go into it because it would it would project bad on the, the original paper itself. I don't know. Mm. Um, I, I feel like receiving criticism is hard and it makes you have to look into your own, you know, any errors you've done or any maybe uh, limitations to your work um, that haven't been fully uh, maybe presented or disclosed. But it's like you said, it's it's critically important. I would absolutely want to respond to this and I would want, um, I think it's valid to be published. And I've had responses from others. You know, I've, I've submitted letters to the editor about other studies and had had more sort of positive response from the authors and the uh, the journal itself. So I was disappointed. Yeah. So I guess there, there are two levels to talk about. So one, we talked about how the authors gave no response. And that could be very personal, sure. Like you mentioned, it's, it's hard to take criticism personally. But the journal has sort of this this duty for scientific integrity. So if someone's pointing out errors in something that they published, and by publishing, they are sort of like de facto promoting it as meeting their criteria for publishing. But someone's pointing out errors, you would think the journal would not take it personally. The journal would be the ones about just pure scientific integrity and wanted to publish that. Did they give you a reason for the rejection or just like rejected? So they they had basically said, you know, in this the case of a matters arising, which is the type of uh, letter that we submitted, we consider that the points raised were interesting and critical, but did not meet the criteria for matters arising at Nature Food. So our, our main criterion for consideration of matter matters arising is the degree to which the comment provides interesting 
and timely scientific advance specific to a peer-reviewed nature food publication. They said the points raised in your matter, matters arising are interesting, and many are foundational to discourse on nutrient profiling systems that go beyond the Food Compass paper. Um, they go on to say, in the present case, we found arguments that nutrient profiling systems generally challenge some aspects of healthfulness of considered, uh, you know, the considered uh, healthfulness of animal source foods of interest. We read with interest about the effect um, of the matrix, matrix effect of foods in terms of processing, bioavailability of nutrients, uh, and the implications that nutrient profiling systems have on reformulation. Um, but they, they go on to say, should you and your colleagues wish to develop a correspondence or comment on the foundational challenge of nutrient profiling systems, we would be interested in assessing it. So they have opened up the door and I, I do plan to, we do plan to submit a more broad comment on nutrient profiling systems. But what I find discouraging is that there is not a, the, this, this, um, our crit criticisms did not seem, uh, warranted to be published actually talking about the food compass paper itself and that's what yeah. i think is um, important because we did we did lay out some important details and you know the editor also wrote back and you know to say that there are you know there are different um, aspects that they are you know are looking into and they want to make sure that everything's accurate in, in the paper but I, i'm i'm a bit discouraged that there's not more uh, willingness to at least consider um, publication or have um a response from the authors because we already did reach out to the authors and um you know it was suggested again at the end of the message that we should reach out again to the to the authors but for me it's it's not something that should go on in private between emails even if that's the case um what yeah. we want to do is just have a have a published document that can express some concerns and have the response uh also published. I think, I think that's important for science. That's how mm -hmm. uh, we proceed with transparency. That's how people are held accountable, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great point. Now, you know, every time, anytime you create some sort of scoring system, uh, the creator's own biases and assumptions get sort of baked into the formula. I mean, I think there's kind of no way around it. And it's clear that this formula really devalues um, animal foods and over over exaggerates the potential harm of animal foods, which is a very popular talking point right now. So do you think that had something to do with your response being rejected, that it goes against the popular talking point right now, that animal foods are dangerous, period? Let's not look into it anymore? You know, I don't know. I think in the West, that is a very um, dominant view. I think the concern is magnified when you think about applying something like this to global contexts where animal source food intake is actually much lower than in the West. And it actually will, you know, the low intake is causing even larger impacts on undernutrition deficiencies and um, things like that. So I don't yeah. know, but <laughs> I, that's just a guessing game at this point about, uh, about that, but. Right. Well, which sort of leads to the second point too. So the, the article, um, uncertainties and impact of small targeted dietary changes on human health and environmental stability. You had a response to that paper as well, which really the, the premise of the paper is really, I think, a little misguided to try and take one food and say, if you eat this, this is how many days it'll help you live longer, or how many days it'll take off your life, and this, how this one food contributes to the environment. Like Just trying to simplify it so much, it's just, I think it's beyond being able to be accurate to that level of simplicity, but you had a, a very good response and thoughtful response again about how it ignores nutrient density and the risks of unpro uh, ultra processed foods and sugar is really diminished. Um, and it, how it's like life and the way we eat is just too complicated. And the global burden of disease that they base this on is really sort of has some assumptions and in inaccuracies as well. And it's just being propagated down. So tell us, you know, first, I guess you can tell us a little bit more about some of the interesting findings that this paper found, um, and a little bit more about your concerns. And then again, your thoughts about why it wasn't accepted. Yeah, sure. So I think one of the, one of the high level findings that, uh, I find quite, uh, interesting and surprising is that uh, a food peanut butter and jelly sandwiches was the top, uh, scoring food to add minutes to your life. So there's a sort of a, a index that they developed, you know, a healthy index that says you're going to have this many minutes uh, gained per day, you're going to have this many minutes lost per day for every serving that you eat. 
So peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, um, which nothing against uh, whole wheat bread and peanut butter. Um, those are, you know, nutritious foods in a, in a balanced, healthy diet. But most peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are made with white bread in the U.S. Only about 16 percent of um, grains are whole grains. And then there's, of course, sugar, you know, tons of sugar in the je- in the jelly used for those sandwiches. So those scoring at the top is, is a sort of a red, red flag for me. <laughs> There's things like non-starchy vegetables that are about one tenth of the, of the life benefit. So it's about three minutes versus 33 minutes, which just does not really make sense with the evidence that we know. Um, things like candy, sh- sweet bakery products, sugars, those had a neutral effect neutral effect. Um, so no that's, harm. that was surprising, no harm. Whereas if you eat poultry or eggs, um, red meat, it's, it's all negative. It all takes minutes away. And so, you know, it's, this is sort of a, this seems like common sense to most people. And I, I was also surprised with these results. And I think it's, I really think it's, um, it's irresponsible to, to put out a study like this because it's one thing, um, the whole premise, as you mentioned, is a little bit suspect, but it's kind of flashy and it's nice. It's kind of cool to see if you could, if you could base it on a lot of uh, robust evidence. The problem is that it's not based on robust evidence at all. Right. You look at the underlying data, the, the actual number of dietary risk factors in the Global Burden of Disease 2016 study, which was used, are very limited. So sugar is not even a factor. Ultra processing, white flour, there's none of those things contribute. And the, the positive um, attributes is just very select um, factors that they have data for. So it's like sometimes, you know, calcium is considered, but, but most nutrients aren't. Um, and there's sort of no... Uh, you don't really show the benefit of like iron rich foods and contributing to reduce anemia. So there's a lot of factors that are not considered. And I think it's a bit irresponsible to break it down to this oversimplification where foods are demonized for, um, I think, uh, really, really, um, weak evidence, um, point. So that's why we wrote the paper. You know, we looked into the details again, and I think there was a lot, there are a lot of good points and, and, uh, it was rejected and a similar response, but no, you know, no invitation to write a more general comment. It was just sort of rejected. The authors did not respond to the uh, comment at all. And so my perspective, it's like, we took, we took a lot of time. There's, there are several authors on this paper, uh, very um, respected authors. And we took a lot of time to go through all of these in detail. We're, we feel like we're doing a service to the scientific community, but then the, um, the discussion is just shut down. There's nothing else that um, will come of it. And it's, it's discouraging. It's, I mean, it's discouraging on a personal level to invest time, but I think in a more important way, it's discouraging because it feels like the scientific process is not proceeding the way it should. Yeah. And um, I'd really like to try to raise attention to that. Um, the same thing with me. If I write a paper and I have, people have been very critical of certain findings, please write a letter to the editor, write a letter to me. I will take it seriously. And I think that's what needs to happen. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great summary. I mean, the the main summary here is just what it says about our scientific process, and it's it's really broken and disturbing that that these what seems like just egregious errors and, and misrepresentations can be published without a, a any sort of concern or rebuttal or or pointing out other alternatives um, not being published to it. And I mean, so you've taken to Twitter and, you know, Twitter is a minefield. You never know what you're going to get in Twitter. I highly recommend people follow your Twitter because it's very thoughtful and, and well-referenced. And, um, and you, so you've posted these on Twitter, um, which is sort of like kind of the way things are going, right? When you have this open forum, do you actually, do you need um, it to be accepted, you know, 20 years ago, if your, if your rebuttal wasn't accepted, you really had no other recourse to get it out, but now you can get it on Twitter. But of course, like I said, you have to be very careful because people are using Twitter for it to spread information. That's maybe not as well researched and thought out as yours. Um, but do you find that as like, okay, at least we have this Avenue to promote it. Or are you like, no, this is still completely inadequate and this is not the way science should be done. Yeah, I think it's inadequate because the main most most of the people who that's reaching are um, not uh, policymakers or even scientists in the scientific community that would say, "Oh, this this study, um, you know, this this raises some important questions. I don't I don't necessarily want to um, proceed with this study the way I had, had intended or something." So, I think it's mm-hmm. certainly a, uh, it's better than nothing to get it out to people and and uh, and whatnot. But I think. One of the one of the examples of a colleague of mine 
colleagues of mine, Alice Stanton and uh, Frederick Leroy, recently had a similar issue where they uh, wrote a letter about the Global Burden of Disease 2019 study that um, found that red meat was, uh, any amount of red meat was harmful. So going from what they had originally done in 2017 of 23 grams down to zero, zero grams of red meat is um, anything above zero is harmful. You know, a 36 fold increase in the number of deaths and no, no clear justification, no um, transparency about how they made that decision. And so their letter to the, to the editor had been rejected and they had even tried with other journals and it took journalists writing articles about this concern to actually get it, the attention of the journal again. And they ended up getting that published about a week or two ago. Yeah. And so I, that's, you know, it's great that they got it published, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't take that. It shouldn't take journalists writing articles in, in n- you know, newspapers to get that attention. It really shouldn't. Right, right. I mean, if you're going to change something that drastically you should have pretty strong evidence to back it up. And that should be clear. And you should be forthcoming with that evidence. And if you don't, that's a problem. And they got called on it. And it it sounds like they didn't want to admit it. But fortunately, with enough groundswell, they they were forced, it seems like externally forced to to accept it. Um, Now, do you think, to go back to the scoring system, you know, the food compass, and then trying to assign, you know, days that you live longer or shorter by eating foods, is it even possible to rate foods this way in in a... in a scientifically based way that's also practical and helpful that, that people can use? Or is food just too complicated? Nutrition is just too complicated without strong enough evidence to make those types of scoring systems. What, what's your thought on that? Well, so in terms of the healthy minutes life, you know, lost or um, added to your life, I don't think we really can do that type of modeling not with our current data that we have and not with the complexity of diets and lifestyles. Um, we don't, I don't think we have data that would allow us to do that. With respect to a healthfulness metric like food compass, we use you know, nutrient profiling or level of processing. I think there are many limitations to the, um, the ability to do that and label individual foods, but I think there could be a role for creating um, balanced um, metrics that can be used to provide some sort of consumer guidance or regulation. And if they, you know, from my perspective, if you sort of had this balance of really considering the level of processing and the intent of processing, so you can kind of capture ultra processed foods and and a lot of these um, factors that are contributing to um, overconsumption and and NCDs, non-communicable diseases, as well as capturing an aspect of nutrient density and and nutrients that are um, of of important um, public health significance. So nutrients that are commonly lacking or where there are deficiencies, I think that they need to be tailored to the context. So if they're going to be used in the U.S., they need to be tailored to the U.S. context. If they're going to be used, you know, in low and middle income countries, they should be tailored. There should be, you know, advisory, there should be an advisory group that can help guide this type of process if you're going to have these ratings. And I think uh, it could be done, but it's, it's not going to ever be perfect and it's not going to be without problems Mm -hmm. because, you have a lot of issues around the science. One, what do we, you know, how do we actually rate these foods when people consume foods in a total diet? And then you have a lot of issues around what is the political landscape for this? What are the all, you know, food, which foods are available and could actually, um, could consumers choose as an alternative? So if you have a food that doesn't score well, what's the alternative option? So there's a lot of, there would be a lot of hurdles to overcome, but I think there is a role. I don't think it's a panacea by any means. There's, there's no way that a, a healthfulness rating is going to solve all of our problems, but um, it, it could make a difference if I think if it was done in a balanced way. Okay, uh, that's a very thoughtful answer, and and a great uh, sort of segue to our podcast where we talk a lot about the the uh, geographical differences and how you can't just have sort of one recommendation for the whole world. So um, if you haven't uh, seen the podcast, it'll probably be coming out shortly. Once you see this video come out shortly afterwards. So keep an eye out for that. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on today and and sort of express to to all our viewers and listeners what you've been doing, why you've been doing it, why you think there are issues here and, and sort of the concern with the the scientific process that you haven't gotten the response that, that you deserve to get. So um, maybe we can do the same thing as with the global burden of disease, get enough groundswell, get enough people talking about this um, and posting about it and writing about it that the journal has to open their eyes and say, you know what, they're right. We do need to publish this. We do need to make this um, 
more available to the scientists and to the people who this is going to impact the most. So, so thank you very much for that work. And thanks for taking the time for coming on today.